Good afternoon and welcome back to the HitLab Innovators Summit. We are so excited to introduce this next panel of hard hitting uh, digital health experts. Um, up next, we have a panel discussion, the Lubongo journey from startup to IPO. We are so excited to welcome Executive Chairman Glenn Tallman of Lubongo and Chief Financial Officer Lee Shapiro, who will be interviewed by IPO reporter Maureen Farrell. This is a, uh, a segment that uh, is a real treat. It's, uh, they're a big part of our Columbia Business School Executive Education Program as part of Digital Health Strategy. And uh, it's my understanding that they have some really exciting new developments that they'd like to announce here today. So uh, I'd like to uh, hand it over to them now. Thank you, Glenn, Maureen, and Lee. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, well, th thank you so much for having all of us. Uh, nice to see you all here in the virtual world. Um, I'll just introduce myself quickly first, and then I'll move on to um, introducing our more exciting panelists. I'm Maureen Farrell. I am the IPO reporter at the Wall Street Journal. I've been covering the IPO beat for about four years. Um, there have been, uh, you know, it's been just a really fascinating journey. Um, had the wonderful opportunity to cover Lavango's IPO, um, and it's been quite quite a ride since then, which we'll get to over the course of this. Covered a lot of tech IPOs, um, including WeWork. And um, if you uh, if you go to the bookstore in June of next year, my book uh, with my colleague Elliot Brown, The Cult of We, will be coming out. So a, a very different journey from Lavango's um, was the journey of WeWork. So. <laughs> um, so, and so here with us today is our Glenn Toulman and Lee Shapiro. And Glenn is an entrepreneur and investor um, who's built many businesses, including most recently Lavango, which is uh, recently sold uh, for almost $18 billion to Teladoc. Um, but he had also been the CEO of Enterprise Systems. He took it through its IPO and eventually sold it to McKesson, who's also the CEO of um, Allscripts. Lee Shapiro here with us today is um, had worked as a CFO of, of Lavango until very recently, and he had also worked mm -hmm. with Glenn previously, among other um, endeavors, as the president of Allscripts until the end of 2012. And now um, they are working together once again. It's something we'll get to talk about. Um, so th thank you both for uh, for this conversation today. Well, thank you, Maureen. It's uh, it's great to be with you again and. And first of all, thank you for your coverage. You covered our IPO, you covered our secondary, you covered our convertible debt offering, and then you covered the $18.5 billion merger. So we appreciate that. And we are anxiously awaiting your book. Um, you. I'm glad that we were not the subject of that book that you wrote, <laughs> um, but we're happy to be the subject of a future book. But anyway, we're, uh, we're excited to, uh, to be here today. Um, well, thank you. And, and Lee, thank you as well. Um, so I guess, you know, maybe Glenn, we'll, we'll start with you. And, you know, I'd like to hear this from both of you. But, you know, in terms of Lavango, you had a very um, personal interest in, you know, when we talk about kind of the genesis of the idea and the company, could we start with that? I mean, you know, this, as we said, this panel discussion is going to be sort of from idea to execution. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Well, um, there's really two different paths of, of the founding of Lavango. Um, one path is very personal, and that is my youngest son, Sam, was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when he was 8. He's now 26 and doing very well. But his journey, being a part of his journey and seeing how hard we made it for people with chronic conditions like diabetes and other chronic conditions, how hard we made it for them to stay healthy was a wake up call for me. So um, a lot of people say, well, this is, you did this for your son. It, not exactly because we knew, and fortunately he had access to great doctors and endocrinologists and certified diabetes educators. We knew he would be okay. But as I became more and more familiar with diabetes, not just type one, but type two, I understood how hard it was and things like co-pays for strips and limiting the access to insulin and how expensive it was. And we just knew we could do better. And that was important because, you know, people with chronic conditions, there's more than 30 million people with diabetes, but one out of every two adults in the United States has a chronic condition. And so we knew if we were going to address this issue that we had to do it at scale. And then the other piece of that was 
we were looking for opportunities to invest. Lee and I have worked together for, gosh, I think it's more than 30 years uh, in a variety of roles. And he'll probably talk more about that. And he's really the brains behind the operation, but, but we've worked together. And as we were searching for opportunities, this entrepreneur came through the door and said he had invented a new kind of connected glucometer. And initially we didn't believe him. And then we realized this was true. We could build not only a company, but a whole platform around this and really change the world. And Lee, I think he was trying to get me out of the fund, but he kind of pushed me into this and said, this was meant for you to do. And so that's really how it started. It was a combination of a personal experience and realizing what an amazing business opportunity this could be, something to truly make a difference and change healthcare. And Lee, could you could you expand on that too? Would love to hear kind of when you when you met this entrepreneur, what did you what did you see, and how how did you find him? How did he come your way? We've been, as Glenn mentioned, involved in the healthcare market for for many years. In fact, when Glenn and I first started investing together. Um, out of it's it's funny to even think of it as a family office. It was more like whatever pocket change uh, we could scrape together at that time and put into companies. But we were investing with this notion that you could use technology to fix broken business process. And when we came to healthcare, we recognized that there was enough broken process to last us a lifetime. So while we were at Allscripts, we met, in fact, had his clients half of the academic medical centers in the US at one point in time. And through those relationships, we were serving leading diabetes centers, including, as you may know, Joslyn out of Boston and Glenn could give a list of some of the other great institutions that we were working with. And we had a network of individuals who would bring us ideas. Um, part of what we found that, that helped us grow, whether it was at Allscripts or our other companies, was listening to our customers, listening to our clients, really partnering with them to understand the challenges that they were facing was a fertile source of ideas for building businesses. And so we actually were introduced to this entrepreneur um, through some of the clients that we'd worked with previously who knew of Glenn's role um, as a, at that point in time uh, on the board of the um, International Board of Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation I mean, a strong interest in diabetes. And, and they brought forward this idea that we were then able to vet through this wonderful network that we had built of leading research institutions to say, how do you think about this? How would it work? What kind of change could this make in a positive way in the lives of individuals with diabetes? Um, so tell us, so, you know, for, for either of you, you, you met this entrepreneur what happens from there? I mean, just walk, uh, walk us through sort of the next, next steps. I mean, it's been quite a journey. Um, you, you see this product, um, it's sort of, you're surprised, you're impressed by it. What comes next? Yeah, I think it, it started as um, there was a technology, but a technology doesn't solve, uh, it's not really a solution. So we took the technology, it was very early on, it wasn't exactly what it was cranked up to be. And we had to then invest the first dollars through our early stage venture firm called Seven Wire Ventures. We put up the money to get that product through FDA clearance. And what year, and sorry, Glenn? What's that? What year was this? That was, Lee, what was the year? End of, so we, we made our investment. We took a controlling stake in the company that kind of had this technology that we then fed into Livongo, but Livongo as an entity didn't exist yet, but we put our money in at the end of 2013. Okay. And, and worked, through the FDA, worked through the FDA approval process for about a year. Yeah, and so kind of in 2014 was, was really the official launch, if you will. That's when I came on as CEO. And, uh, and then it took off from there and it was really you know, like every company starts off, you start with one customer, you're learning. But this was also not about a technology. In fact, our conclusion was that more and more healthcare, and we all know this today, it's more confusing, it's more complex, and it's more costly than ever, despite all of our efforts. So our idea was, how do we create an experience that people would trust, that they knew that 24 hours a day, we were there for them to 
satisfy their needs. And it was about not engaging people, but how do we empower people with chronic conditions to live better and healthier lives? How do we put them back in charge of their care? And having this technology and then the data science behind it allowed us to say 24 hours a day, we're there for you. We're monitoring you. If in fact you're dangerously low, your blood sugar is dangerously low or dangerously high, we'll be on the phone to you in a minute and saying, what do you need right now? How can we be of assistance to you? And that really changed the game because healthcare operates 24 hours a day. And yet we're, we've been shoot into a system that says maybe you can get an appointment tomorrow or the day after, as long as you want to take off work and it's during the eight to five time frame, not including lunch, that's not the healthcare system we want. And what we've seen in every other part of the economy, we've seen 24 by seven instant access, instant information, consumers in charge. So the idea, and then we brought in um, probably, I think the most successful now investor in Silicon Valley, uh, Hemant in Asia, we brought Hemant in from General Catalyst, and he then joined us on our first round, our first official round after our initial investment, and put up you know additional funding to go after this. But the idea was, how do we take the smarts of Silicon Valley and blend them with all of our experience from healthcare and create a new kind of experience for people that they wouldn't just like, but they would actually love. And people love using Google. They just use it. Nobody's forcing them. Nobody's encouraging them. Nobody gives you an incentive. Nobody trains you. And people like Airbnb and they like to use Netflix. And they love when Amazon recommends people like you like this book and they get it right. We said, why can't we create that same experience in healthcare? And the answer is we could. And the answer is we did. And that's what made Mavango so valuable because we had a base that was recurring revenue up in the cloud, software as a service, and nobody stopped using it. Our customer and our client retention, we call them members, and member retention or client retention was above 90%, unheard of in healthcare, above 90%, and people loved it. And that's really what we were able to do. And I think that set the stage then for a whole series of other folks to say, consumer digital health is real. And now we're going to do IPOs. Now we're going to raise more money. And I can't tell you the number of notes that Lee and I got from competitors saying, thank you for paving the way. Um, you've just doubled our own valuation. <laughs> we're like, well, we think that's good, but it really is good to drive innovation that works and that's measurable and that truly improves outcomes. And that's, I think, the big story of Lavango wasn't just about what we did, it was paving the way for a new kind of healthcare experience. So I guess, could you know, to the, to the point you're making, if we could take a step back, and I mean, one question to go along with this, I guess just for our audience today, let's just make, I realize maybe we haven't fully introduced Livongo for people who don't understand it. So I'd love, love you both to just kind of walk us through exactly what you were doing. But along with that, I think you're sort of speaking to this one of the things I thought was fascinating when I first learned, when we first spoke about Lavango um, and your work, you sort of brought up this point, um, which I think is in, ter in terms of consumer digital medicine is like nothing, there's so little in medicine um, that's beautiful or like, you know, you think you have the iPhone and you, you love like the aesthetic of it. You love how it works and the functionality of it. Like you so rarely associate that with anything medical. It's all harsh. It's like, and, you know, for people with diabetes, I mean, it's just the, the constant um, invasion of needles and all these things. And I mean, one of the things you mentioned was sort of seeking to make it look nice to not look like sort of a harsh um, thing that you're gonna have to use every every piece of it. So I guess yeah. can I ask you to like, take a step back and just walk us through what exactly Lavango did just for whoever is in a way. Sure. And then I'd well, love if, to hear you talk if, about that. If and by, have, by the way, this, this was not something that, that came easy. Um, you know, as we talked about, as we were going through FDA approvals and the like, um, and, and sometime after we had invested in General Catalyst and, and Hemant Tanasia, who Glenn mentioned, who's now a 
actually was a good friend and a partner in other deals prior, but we've really developed a close relationship through our Livongo experiences. He was encouraging us to open up development offices in Silicon Valley um, and to really take advantage of the consumer focus that existed there from great companies like Apple, who you mentioned. And Glenn and I, um, being a bit more frugal and, and from the Midwest, you know, looking at what rents were, we thought, you know, maybe we should take the money we invested in this technology and, and like buy an office building because rents out here are triple what we're paying in Chicago and like salaries are double what we're paying in Chicago. And, and like, not that Chicago is like a small market, um, but it was about this infusion of, of consumer design principles, um, looking at the jobs to be done by consumers that we could meet with this technology that was an important bridge that we crossed in terms of designing uh, what, what became part of the Livongo experience. And, and maybe just, you know, Glenn, if you want to just, you know, give that background on what Livongo does, um, certainly jump in with that. And then we can talk a little bit more about um, how it evolved. Yeah, uh, I think, you know, for those people who are not familiar with diabetes, if you have diabetes, typically you're actually pricking your finger with something called a lancet, a little needle, drawing a little drop of blood. Then you have a meter and it has a strip in it and you, you put that drop of blood on the strip and then you get a reading and it's just a number and it tells you where your blood sugar is. The average blood sugar might be 100. Sometimes if you have diabetes, you're dangerously high. Your blood sugar is too high or it's too low. If it's too low, you could have a seizure. If it's too high, it's really doing a lot of damage to your body and you could also have a seizure. So all of that is an issue for people and the strips used to be very expensive um, and the whole process was tough, but then you just ended up with a number which wasn't particularly helpful without any context. So at Lavanga, we literally thought through the entire process and it was not only how we made it look, it was, hey, you have a meter, but you also need um, packaging for that meter. When people get this, they ought to feel like it's an iPhone. And people would literally, it would arrive and people wouldn't realize initially what it was because it was so beautiful, as you point out. And then the case, we had to design a case because my own son said, hey, your first case, he said, it really sucks. And I said, well, what would you do? And he became part of the design team. <laughs> he said, well, you have to do this or you have to do that or you need uh, three little zippers to store needles and to store your extra strips because you can't just throw them away because they have blood on them. And and every aspect of the interaction. And then being available 24 by seven, and even how we answer the phone, instead of saying what you would normally say, can I help you, which seems great, except that means I have the answers and you're helpless. Instead, we would answer, what do you need right now? And then there's only one person who can answer that, you, you're back in charge. So every aspect of this was designed. We'd also call people, um, when they were dangerously low or dangerously high, sometimes you're not thinking well. So we would call them and they'd literally say things like, you called at the perfect moment. And it was almost embarrassing to say, well, we know that because we, we can see what's happening in your body right now. So that ability to have that. And then last but not least, we had the context. So our data science would say, well, if you're a young 18 year old woman, what we might say to you is very different than a 56 year old Hispanic man who we might be talking to in Spanish because the meter works in Spanish and all of our conversations for that person would be in Spanish to make them comfortable. And so everything about this was contextualized and personalized to make them comfortable and to say, we're here, you can trust us. Um, all the strips are now free. If you lost your meter, no questions asked. We send you one FedEx the next day. You have another one. We took all of the hassle out of it, all the confusion out of it. And we were solely focused on keeping people healthy. And we helped employers understand that the investment they made to keep them healthy was actually a good economic investment because it kept them out of the hospital and it kept them healthier and spending less money. So we were able to 
get over that transom almost like preventive care, but because it's a chronic condition, it's every day, 24 hours a day. And that's what we built. So, so we tried to take a process that was all black, all unfriendly. And, you know, and I, I'll just tell one quick story. I can remember my son was running out of test strips. Remember with type one, you have to take insulin to keep alive. And we called our insurance company and they said, well, it's two weeks too early to send test strips, but we can send needles right now. And I don't want to tell you what I said because we're on the uh, we're on the air right now. But it was inconceivable that someone could even say that. And they said, "Well, if it's an emergency, go to the ER." I said, "I just want a little package of strips to keep my son alive." Do you not understand that? And they truly didn't. And at Lavango, we truly did. We had that empathy. A third of our employees either had a chronic condition or had a family member who did. So we built a company around really focusing on how do we be there for people? And they were our people, they were family, they were friends, they were co-employees and people got it. So I guess that kind of leads to a few questions. I mean, it's, it, that story is horrifying and um, you know amazing that it, it feels like the experience that you shouldn't even have to think about is what you were giving people. And it had been so different. Um, and, and it's it, still happening today, by the way. Every day for non-Lavango users, people are told they can't get their insulin, they can't get strips. I mean, it's, it's inconceivable, particularly in America, that that can be going on. People are being overcharged for strips and overcharged for insulin every single day. So, you know, the, the task is not done, but we started to make a dent in showing people how to do it. Go ahead. So I guess to that question, I mean, and we, I'd love to sort of speak on this from different angles and hear your thoughts. But I mean, in terms of innovation, when you just speaking about kind of Silicon Valley versus, you know, traditional medicine. It's obviously medicine the, in, in a lot of ways, it's sort of lagged, especially consumer. I mean, we're seeing, we're seeing incredible things. I mean, anyone who um, had any issues with pharmaceutical companies, I think is, we'll be grateful for pharmaceutical companies for um, years, but, you know, with the vaccines, I mean, there's, there's such incredible science going on, but you know, it's, it's clunk, like from, from what you see, what you could do on your smartphone versus, you know, when you call and um, your doctor and want to go to another doctor and you have to like go to their office to physically get your records and, you know, the ease at which you're used to doing everything else in your life. And then you go to your medical care providers and, um, you know, especially if you have parents with a lot of illnesses, you see, you see so many different things or children, um, Anyway, so just with that as sort of the backdrop, uh, could you talk more? I mean, maybe we could just start, you talk about, um, you know, making companies aware of how it will save, like, just could you talk about how you figured out the revenue model um, for Livongo? Because I think, you know, kind of what you unlock there is really just key for so many businesses going forward in this space. Well, one of the things that we had learned in approaching the marketplace and understanding why programs that managed care organizations and self-insured employers were providing to their members didn't work um, was because oftentimes the incentives were misaligned. And, and what you find is that many employers offer programs for wellness um, and they're paying for it on a per employee per month basis but few people are using it. And, and in fact, the employer is not seeing a return on that investment because utilization isn't there. So when we started looking at the right model for Livongo, we said that we would put our money where our mouth is, or frankly, your money as a buyer, where our mouth is. And, and by saying that you only pay us for people who participate. So we flipped the business model on its head and said, you'll pay us a per participant per month fee. That aligns incentives. We now are focused on getting people to use this. And when they use it, then you'll save money. And so within the first year of someone signing on with Livongo, 
we were able to demonstrate in, in virtually every case that we measured return on investment that exceeded two to one, in many cases, three to one, because we were maniacally focused on delivering a great consumer experience, something that our members love to use. We were supporting them. They were sending us these amazing stories and we had a net promoter score, which measures how likely someone is to recommend your service to their friends and others um, that rivaled that of great consumer product companies like Apple. And, and with that great utilization, we were generating revenue, but our clients were generating savings. And it's what Zane Burke, our, our CEO, uh, would call the virtuous business model of Livongo. And it was truly something that was uh, amazing to watch because that flywheel continued to build on itself. Well, Maureen, I think that uh, you know the, the listeners might appreciate the fact that that model, it's a lot better if you're the company selling something to say, we get paid whether or not people use it. Just pay mm-hmm. us for all of your employees per employee per month. And that's what was the standard. When we came along and said, only pay us if they use it and only pay us if they keep using it, our investors said, are you sure about this? What if they stop using it? We're in trouble. We said, yes, we are. <laughs> and you know that meant we had to be, as Lee said, so focused on making sure the experience was one that you didn't have to convince people. They knew it was better. And, but that is the new standard. We see people slipping back. Well, let's go back to per employee per month because that was better. Better for who? No, you ought to have a service that's so good that people want to keep using it. You don't have to bribe them or convince them or anything else. And that alignment, which is much more consumer focused, is where we think healthcare has to move to. So, so I think that's critical. But you also mentioned something else about, look, we think that we have the best science in the world right here in the U.S., the best doctors, the best endocrinologists. So that's not our challenge. Our challenge is how do we get from there to delivering that world-class healthcare experience to the people who need it? And that's where that middle is where we've fallen down. And that middle is where all the cost is. And I think the future of healthcare is about taking that middle out. Good software removes the middle. It puts the user closer to the the product and the information. So if you think about our access to almost everything outside of healthcare, it's very close to direct. If you're, you know, you're using software and today, if we want to book a flight, we don't go through a third party who is in the middle called the travel agent. Uh, we go directly on and we have more information. In fact, when Travelocity first came out, this crazy thing happened. Travel agents started to use it because hmm. it was better information than they had on their own systems. And now when we want to book a hotel, we go to a website and we have choices of all different hotels. And when we want to call a car, we do it ourselves using our phone and people think it's better and easier and you are in charge. You get to decide, do I need a minivan? Do I need a large? Do I need a limousine? All that's at your fingertips and it arrives in minutes. So the idea is we're gonna bring that same level of control of empowering people and meeting them where they are um, back to healthcare. And I think you're also gonna see more and more of that move outside the four walls of the hospital closer to consumers. And we, we have, you know, when you think about the pandemic, we know about the terrible loss of life and we know about the economic impacts that'll be devastating. We know about the mental health impacts. Um, we saw that in our own products about how they shot up. But I think we will see years later, the fact that the acceleration of digital in so many areas, but most important in healthcare and in education will be the first step to solving a lot of these problems longer term. So I think the other thing we'll talk about 10 years from now was how we accelerated healthcare into the digital age and education because digital creates abundance. You know, when you think about it, we can provide a lecture can now be provided not just to 50 kids sitting in a very exclusive ivy colored building, uh, covered building, you know, in Boston or Stanford or anywhere else, 
but it can be provided to thousands of people all around the world. We should have been doing that long ago to spread that knowledge. And similarly, healthcare turns out is in many respects an information business. How do we do that? That's a big part of what we were doing at Livongo with this incredible data science, what we call applied health signals. We invented that term to say, what if you took all the signals coming from our own bodies and processed them and fed them back to us, applied them and made us smarter about our own healthcare? And that was, I think, the other secret of what we were doing. We were allowing people to be healthier. We were telling them all those numbers they got from their meter, here's what to do with them. And here's what works best for people who are like you. Here's what's worked in the past. And they love that. So I'm going to just skip for a second for, uh, over to a question from the audience. Um, then I have a few follow-ups, but um, this is from audience member Charlie Garland, who's asking Jen Lee, uh, Jen Lee, oh, sorry, Glenn and Lee, uh, I'm reading this. Did you utilize strategic tools in your design, such as empathy diagram, customer journey map, bus model canvas? Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with those terms, but um, I'm sure you, you well, both are. We, we certainly are. And Charlie, the answer is yes. Um, in fact, um, our fund, Seven Wire Ventures, um, was formed with the belief that, that we face too many hassles as consumers. Um, and None of us want to be patients. All of us want to be healthy. And so what are the barriers in the way of, of allowing that to happen? Well, we spend a lot of time looking at uh, consumer, uh, consumer journey mapping. Um, it's a process we do. We actually call it hassle mapping. Um, and in terms of the design work that was done for Livongo, um, we spent tremendous amount of time working with our teams. And just to give you perspective, a third of, of the employees at Livongo, the team members at Livongo, had a chronic condition, many of them diabetes. Another third had family members who have a chronic condition. And so we were able to take from their experiences and from what we saw in the market and to use that in terms of helping us not only design the product, but really the process that surrounds it. It was everything from what, what did you see when you first opened the box? How did you get the box? You know, what was going to be your onboarding experience as a member? Um, we would change, Glenn likes to say, um, change the language, change the culture. And so we never referred to someone as a diabetic. It was always an individual with diabetes. Someone doesn't want to be known by their disease. You want your disease in the background. That, that's not who you are. It doesn't define you. And so we used all of that in terms of thinking about ways we interacted with people. Um, and uh, a, a great example of this um, was um, we would find ourselves in situations where because we had members all over the US, um, if there was an unfortunate occurrence like a hurricane um, in Louisiana <coughs> or um, fires in, in Northern California, um, and members were being displaced. We would find that our team, like on their own, would start taking up collections for our members to say, people are going to need to get medications. People are going to need assistance. Like, what can we be doing to help them? And that was the type of culture it inspired when you are using things like empathy in the design process, because you truly feel what the members feel. Yeah, the only thing I would add is, one benefit that we had is because, as Lee mentioned, so many people had a personal familiarity with it. While we used the tools, there was an, an, an advantage of people having lived it. You know, our, our president, Dr. Jennifer Schneider, she had type one. She had, you know, she had lived with this and knew intuitively things that this wasn't about a product manager per se. This was about people who live this every day. So, and they were users. Everybody there was using our systems. So when something didn't work, it wasn't a theoretical thing. This was real life. Now, the other thing, and I, I give one of my sons credit for it. Uh, he was one day early in the company's history playing a RPG, a role-playing game, a video game downstairs. And I walked down trying to be the good dad. And I said, 
hey, I'm, I want to learn to play this game. I'm going to play it with you. Where's the instruction manual? And he looked up at me and he said something that really guided us in many ways. He said, Dad, nothing smart has instructions anymore. And really, the idea was if we were going to have millions of users, we couldn't have a training manual. We couldn't. It had to arrive and they had to start using it. We had no training. We had no number to call. They intuitively knew how to use it. You would stick the strip in, it would turn on. Or you could turn it on either way. If you pull the strip out, you could turn it off or it would turn off automatically. We assumed if someone was going to stick the strip in um, that they wanted to use it. So turn the, turn the thing on. Every aspect of what we were doing. We initially sent out these little packages with, that held the strips and they were sealed. We got a special approval to take the seal off because we knew that for a lot of our members who are above the age, our average age was 57 for people with type two diabetes. Um, it was hard to pull that plastic off. We've all dealt with that. So we said, how can we make a bottle that you just open up and start using? And how can we make sure when the unit arrived, it's already charged, ready to go? Really important things because if you get it, if you get anything and you go to use it, it doesn't work. I mean, what's your, your initial feeling is, oh my God, it already doesn't work. Um, remember, I don't want to do this anyway. We talked about, you know, the name. The name came from research. We did research with people with chronic conditions. They said two things. They didn't talk about diabetes or hypertension. They said, I just want to live my life. I want this to be the center of my life. Don't call me a a diabetic, call me a person. And I happen to have diabetes and a lot of other stuff. Make it go away. Just want to live my life. And by the way, I'm on the go. So don't tether me to a hospital or a doc's office. So he brought in this neighbor and he looked at all this data and he said, they want to live their life on the go. You will be the Vongo. Hmm. And initially we all said, what? Shouldn't we be diabetes.com? And I said, no, you're more than diabetes and they hate their diabetes. Don't be something they hate, be something they aspire to. They just want to live their life and they're on the go, live on go. And that's where that came from. So another question from the audience that's uh, sort of uh, segues in nicely from um, the question you just answered is, this is from Michael Peterson. He's asking, what can we do to make adherence to medication be more compelling and fun? Technology such as smart medication bottles alone can't solve this problem, as we know. Well, Michael, it's a great question. It's an area that Glenn and I are, are both pretty passionate about. Um, and, and I'll date ourselves here, but when we were at Allscripts, um, we released the first electronic prescribing solution. It was like one of those um, Alexander Graham Bell moments where like we were sending out the first electronic prescription, but we had someone like run it over to the pharmacy in their car just to make sure that it got there and the pharmacist would fill it like on paper because we didn't know how the pharmacy would react to the electronic prescription. But we were inspired by an Institute of Medicine report uh, to Air is Human that talks about the number of avoidable deaths that can occur um, because of medication errors and certainly because of adherence challenges. Um, even today with electronic prescribing in place, 20% of prescriptions written are never filled. And within six months, more than half of people on chronic medications are no longer compliant. And so we have to do better. We have to find ways to encourage people to be more adherent. At Seven Wire, we invested in a company called MediSafe. I don't know Michael, so this wasn't a planted question and it wasn't intended to be a plug for a portfolio company, but they've analyzed using this consumer journey mapping process, all the reasons, hundreds of them, why people are not compliant with taking their medications. They don't do the first fill because they have cost issues. So how do you address the affordability problem? They have access issues. How can you make sure the medications get to them as opposed to making them go to their doctor's office. Um, Glenn used an example of, of his son, Sam, with my daughter, Tracy. Recently, she did a medication refill that normally she'd have to drive 45 minutes through Los Angeles traffic, sit and wait in a doctor's office for another half hour, see a doctor for five minutes to get a prescription, and then drive back and take it to a pharmacy and wait. And she did all of that online in five minutes, and the medications were shipped to her here. Like that's a great consumer experience and that's what we want. 
But what MediSafe has done to make the technology work for us is that they've built in solutions like uh, allowing you to have a med friend, could be a family member, could be someone in your care circle, could be someone else who has a condition like yours uh, as a buddy system to encourage you to take your medication. So there's a, a commitment aspect to this that for those of you who've ever uh, said that you're running a marathon, you know how those commitments uh, can push you along in terms of achieving your goals. And they've done other things around gaming in terms of the applications to make it something that's responsive for someone to understand where they are at a given point in time in terms of why they might not be taking their medications. So I think there's a lot that we can do. And irrespective of our portfolio company, I think that every medication should be prescribed with tools like this to help all of us on our journey in terms of managing the medications that we take. And there's, there's a ton of focus. So, you know, Lee mentioned one of our companies, but if you, you can't turn on the TV today without seeing an ad from PillPack or Capsule or all these folks who want to make it easier to stay healthy. And that's what we have to do. Everybody has to understand that if we keep people healthy, that's the lowest cost solution that we have to rein in healthcare costs and keep them healthy. It's kind of, you know, what our, our slogan should be is take two of these and don't call me in the morning, which is, uh, you know, it used to be take two of these and call me in the morning. No, don't call me because they will take care of your issues. So it's, how do we make it easier to stay healthy? How do we remove the cost barriers? Those are the two biggest issues. Everything else, I think, gets to you know rounding error and there's great services and digital companions, but you just got to make it easier, make it an easier choice to stay healthy. Um, so Michael has a quick follow-up and then I want to talk about, um, make sure we have time to just talk about the IPO. So we'll, then we'll move on to, the, on to that. But his follow-up is, um, Sometimes I can't even remember if I took my medication 15 minutes ago. So is there a place to combine MetaSafe with smart packaging? So they actually do have relationships with um, smart pill bottles with some of the home dispensers that, that are also smart devices. There's some interesting home robots that have cute faces and the like. Um, we got Glenn one to be a companion during COVID, you know, just to make sure he wasn't lonely. Um, but <laughs> But there's a variety of ways that those things can interact. And, and actually, MediSafe also links to Samsung G watches and, and Apple watches and the like. So lots of ways for these various tools to interact to make sure that you know that you've taken your medications. Um, interestingly enough, when, when my mother was alive, um, she used MediSafe. And, and if she hadn't reported on a daily basis that she had taken her medications, I would get a notification. I didn't need to know which medication she took. And otherwise, I didn't want to know what she missed. All I wanted to know is whether or not she'd actually engaged. And if she engaged with the application, I knew that everything was fine. If she didn't engage that day, I knew to call her. And those are the types of things that you can do with technology that make for a better consumer adherence relationship. But, but again, and this is not an investment, if you use PillPack, they individually package each one and put the date on the package. And so if you forget, I was on a statin for a while and I would go and I would do the same thing. I would forget, did I take it or not? I'd go up and I'd see the package with today's date on it was already gone. So I knew I took it today. And then occasionally I'd go there and I'd say, hey, yesterday's package is there too. I knew I missed one. So there's some really simple things. I think we're gonna get there making it easier. And then we have to convince people that that will keep them healthier and they gotta feel that as well. So let's talk about the IP, uh, your IPO for Livongo. Um, so it was last July, you, it, you were valued at about $4.4 billion, raised a, a little less than $400 million. Um, it's a big- 500, 550 with the green shoe, but who's counting? Okay, <laughs> Who, who's counting? Um, you know, even, even at that size and, um, you know, th that amount raised, it, it, you, maybe this is overstating it, but you know, companies have been waiting longer and longer to go public. I mean, that was a, a good size IPO. Obviously, um, you know, your investors, I'm sure, like counting their lucky stars just from a financial perspective of what happened over the next year. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. 
But all that said, what made you, and, but this is sort of an, even an upsized um, IPO from, you know, just kind of where you went out with the expectations. Obviously the, um, the market reception was um, amazing, but what made you decide to go to the IPO market then with so many companies waiting? And especially, I remember covering your IPO, there weren't a ton of, um, as we said, there were, there were very few obvious comps, you know, there you yeah. sort of were real pioneers going out there when you did in, in the, um, you know, telemedicine, like sort of combining a SaaS company, you know, having the, having investors sort of think through a, a medical company as a SaaS company. And I'm sure now that ha- those who did are happy they did, but well, I think there, uh, I'll give you my perspective. And I, I love that Lee commented on you saying exactly how much we raised. That, that's his CFO hat coming on. But um, look, there's, there's a number of reasons that you do an IPO. First and foremost, it is a branding event in today's world. So when you do an IPO, everybody knows it. Our biggest customers were at the time large self-insured employers. They want to know that you have the stability, that you're a big public company. So it helps, it's an advertising event. You know, you're all over the world now and people are learning the name. So that's number one. Number two, we had created a new category called Applied Health Signals. And we wanted to make sure that we could define that category. We didn't want someone else coming out and people say, oh, they do the, don't they do the same thing as those folks? So when you, when you study companies that create their categories, their returns to investors are about 10x what the second or third wow. uh, player is. So, you know, uh, that was important to us to define our own category. Now, you raised the fact that initially, hey, it was great, the stock went like this. And then we had this period where the stock went down. Why did it go down? No one understood. People would say, well, are you a strip and meter company? Are you a diabetes company? Are you a data science company? Are you a coaching company? Are you a tech company or a healthcare company? We had created something new and it took about six months, maybe as much as nine months for people to understand that this was a new category we had created. Um, But so number one, branding. Number two, defining a category. Number three, actually having currency and that's currency to make other acquisitions and the like it's easier to do that with stock and so you have a definition here's what the company's valued at here's what the stock's worth here's where we think it's going Um, and last but not least you know there are some of your investors who want to exit you know who aren't in for the long term that's not their job and so you give a broader you know a broader purview to people and they have more transparency when you're public. Every quarter they can see how the company's doing. So all of those were reasons. But the one thing I'd say that's most important and Lee was absolutely a bear on this and that is don't go public until you're ready. You have to know that you can deliver quarter after quarter. And every quarter we were public, we met, exceeded, met the expectations of the market, we exceeded the expectations, and we raised our our guidance every single quarter. And you have to have a very fine-tuned operating model. And I give Lee a lot of credit for for forcing the rest of us to have the discipline um, to operate in that environment. But that's what the market respects. Lee, anything else? Yeah, it's Maureen. It's really harder, so, by the way, to be public. That's for sure. So a couple, a couple of things, uh, you know, one, why are companies waiting longer? Um, there's a tremendous amount of liquidity in the market and we could have stayed private. Um, we had great sponsors, including Shinovac and General Catalyst and Sapphire, wonderful investors who were willing to continue to support the company. And, and I, I want to make sure I say this the right way because it's not bragging, but we had investors who were coming to us, seeing that we were on the unicorn track and wanting to invest ahead of an IPO. And so they were offering us additional money. So we could have raised the same $500 million easily in a private transaction. I think timing was a big part of getting out in the summer of 2019. There was still 
137 Democratic candidates for president at that time. <laughs> um, there was an election coming up this year. Um, we had no, no idea of what, of course, was going to occur in February with regard to the awareness around COVID. But we knew that 2020 was going to be a tumultuous year. And, and so we did really put a lot of effort in. I give so much credit to the team working very hard to get our financial underpinnings, uh, the infrastructure in place that would be necessary to meet the requirements of public reporting every quarter and, and to build the machine that was going to be able to produce the types of information that we would want to give in a transparent way to our, our public shareholders. Uh, the other thing that I'd mentioned about um, going public was that um, it does provide you with access, rapid access to additional capital. Um, we did a secondary offering in December of the same year that we went public. Um, in May of, of this year, we did a convertible debt offering. Um, both of those were accomplished with one day of marketing. Wow. Um, and, and, you know, especially in May of this year, everything was done by Zoom in one day. Um, and we, we raised, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars doing that. And so that's part of the reason why you want to be public is to have that transparency for people to know your story, to read analyst reports, to um, understand more about your financials. And, and that gives them the confidence that they can invest in a company um, that is going to continue on that trajectory. So I have, I have an endless amount of more questions. I, an hour is longer than I almost ever get to do. I don't know about uh, both of you for a panel discussion, but I feel like we could talk for a whole nother hour. Um, and I've, I have enough questions to fill that. But we're gonna we'll ask we'll ask Stan if we can extend. I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sounds um, like you need to do a book. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get an, another a sequel or something totally different from my, from this one. Um, but I guess you know, with only a couple of minutes left now, I, you know, I I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to talk more about your decision to sell to Teladoc because um, I think that that deal is a really interesting one and could really shape the future of medicine. Well. We'll have to come back for that. Um, but I guess, you know, if you could both just as a, as a wrap up to this, if you'd like to address that quickly, but also just kind of what's, what's next? I know you've, you're part of a, raising a SPAC to go out and acquire a company. I mean, if you could say one thing about what you see as sort of the next wave for medicine and sort of like innovation in medicine for the consumer. Um, sorry, they're, they're all broad, but we only we only have a minute or two left. I'd love you both to just have your kind of your final thoughts around these. Well, the I'll, uh, I'll start and I'll, I'll try to be very brief. One, on the merger with Teladoc, what we saw is customers were calling us saying, hey, I have a sinus infection. Can you help? Can you help? And we couldn't at that point. We'd say, why are you calling us? And they'd say, you're the only ones who answer the phone. You're available 24 by 7 and you care. And so we knew we had needed to add it some, some capability. We needed to add telehealth capabilities. We started to search. We also knew we wanted to be international. Teladoc was the leader in telehealth. They were already in 50, more than 50 countries and there was no overlap. And the more we looked at both businesses, this started with a conversation that, a walk that Lee took with uh, their head of strategy, Drew Turrets, and the two of them came back and they said, we could partner or we could put the companies together and that would create the largest single virtual care provider in the world. And uh, you know, that's really what that vision was. Relative to SPACs, I think you know, Lee and I are both involved in different SPACs and the idea is there's a lot of money available and people are saying they wanna give it to people who understand healthcare, it's a growth business and use that money to help accelerate things that are going to change healthcare in the future. And last but not least, I'll just comment that I think in part driven by what we've seen that we're all one community in health worldwide with the pandemic, digital health will accelerate. I think we have to focus on how do we provide basic health care to everybody. And last but not least, we have to dramatically transform the system 
And Lee and I and our fund are both focused on what's the next thing that we can, as someone said recently, lavangalize the rest of the system uh -huh. to make it caring and empathetic, consumer focused and meet consumers where they are. Lee? It's great to be a verb. Yeah, so, so um, similar comment, um, I'll, I'll start on the SPAC side. Uh, Glenn is on the board of, of one SPAC, I'm on the board of another. But the idea is um, to um, help accelerate some of the platforms that can exist in, in healthcare um, to continue on the journey that we started with Livongo and Maureen that you highlighted what started in 2019. Uh, we see great opportunities to do that. I believe that when we um, next do this panel, we won't be talking about digital health. Um, in fact, we will have failed if we're still talking about digital health. It's just health. Like this is the way we practice and this is how it should be and, and everything should be integrated together. Um, from a prediction standpoint, I, I'd say two things and we're very focused on this as part of our thesis at, at Sevenwire. And in fact, we'll be publishing later this month our 2021 predictions as we we do every year the, the seven from seven wire. Um, but behavioral health um, has taken center stage. Um, there's not a call I don't have with someone who either personally or with a family member uh, isn't impacted by some of the consequences that have, have come from this pandemic that relate to our mental wellness. And there's a shortage of mental health professionals. There's a number of great companies doing wonderful things. As you may know, Teladoc has an offering called um, Better Help. In, in Livongo, we had an offering called My Strength that powers our behavioral health offerings. But there's such a tremendous need for behavioral health support that I see that as probably being a, an area that's going to get a lot more attention as we move into next year. Great. Well, Glenn and Lee, thank you so much. This was an um really insightful and inspiring conversation um, and look forward to the follow-up and um, we'll see if these predictions, especially, I mean, I like the idea of this just being health care as we know it, Livongoized healthcare. <laughs> <laughs> well, we like that too. Thank you. And we can't wait to read the book. We're excited about it. Thank you so much. Okay. Have a great Thanks Maureen. Um, thank nice. you to everyone at HitLab. Thank you. Thank you all so very much to join us. And just on a personal note, I really love the story about your son inspiring the, uh, the smart uh, devices and the, the no instruction needed component. I think that's really awesome. And I hope that we can all look to different places for inspiration. Uh, live on go, live on the go. Uh, our knowledge partner here at the 2020 Hit Lab Innovator Summit. Thank you so much. You can hear Glenn and Lee's lecture on digital transformation at the Columbia Business School Digital Health Strategy Program next semester live online on March 16th. You can contact me or Dr. Stan Kichnowski about attending the program or even the Health Data Science program for non-technical executives next week on LinkedIn for the HitLab Summit discount. Again, thank you so much to Glenn, Lee, and Maureen. It was a real pleasure and an honor to have you joining us here today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.